The Origins of SpaceX Part 2. If you haven't seen the previous part, I recommend you go back and check out the formation of the company as well as going all the way up to the first launch of the Falcon 1. But if you have seen it, let's continue on by discussing how does SpaceX recover from their first failed launch. Well, it turns out just a few weeks after this attempt, there would be a saving grace, something that not only helped the company grow, but also the entire commercial spaceflight industry. And this was that NASA would help fund the development of reliable and cost-effective methods to get to low Earth orbit. More specifically, funding private spaceflight companies to create launch vehicles like SpaceX was doing. Now, why would NASA want to do this? Let's put our mindset in 2006. They still had the space shuttle operating, and it wasn't scheduled to retire until 2010. But they were trying to figure out a way to use cost-effective or lower-cost methods of getting to low Earth orbit. And one way is they could create their own launch vehicle, but we've seen in the past that that is incredibly expensive. Another way is using government-funded companies, big aerospace companies, to get their products to the International Space Station. Again, a pretty expensive endeavor. So they wanted to try and kickstart the commercial spaceflight industry. They wanted to put some money in to see whether or not launch vehicles could actually be competitive and make it much cheaper to get to orbit. So when they made this announcement, both SpaceX and a company called Rocket Plane Kistler were given part of this $500 million to try and develop the launch vehicle. More specifically, SpaceX received $278 million to focus on the development of the Earth Falcon 9 and Dragon capsule. But why not Falcon 1? Well, the Falcon 9 and the Dragon capsule would be responsible for taking cargo supplies to the International Space Station. So NASA was trying to fully focus on developing the larger launch vehicles, not the smaller Falcon 1 version. However, from SpaceX perspective, they wanted to be able to get Falcon 1 to work before they tried something bigger. Because if they can't get something small enough to actually function, then there's no point whatsoever in trying to scale it up 10 times stronger. So SpaceX spent the next year working on their Falcon 1, improving the development and corrosion aspects so that the engine would actually function correctly this time. They also focused on some other anomalies, but it's not for certain how many changes they actually made. Now, the launch would occur in March 20th of 2007, so about a year later from the previous one. So let's watch the video and see what happens. Some of the first notable differences is the control they have over the vehicle. There are very little oscillations early on in the flight, and the controller looks pretty great. Up until stage separation, the mission is looking perfect. Now once the stage separates, you can briefly see the nozzle of the second stage hit the side of the vehicle, also called the inner stage. The minor impact ended up redirecting the control system on the gimbal, causing a small helium leak. And this helium is what is used to control the gimbling engine, therefore once it ran out, the engine would start oscillating. Now in the final report, it said that major oscillations began around four and a half minutes into the flight, but the only available footage only goes to that point. So at the end, we could see the nozzle beginning to oscillate just slightly. Now they eventually had to shut down the engine due to this oscillations, which means the Falcon 1 did not reach orbit. However, Musk and SpaceX saw this launch as somewhat of a success. This is because they received a lot of information regarding the flight of Falcon 1, how to control it, as well as what ways they can improve upon it for the next launch. Therefore, they knew that they had to get the stage separation to work perfectly in order to possibly achieve orbit on the very next launch. Now once the word got out that SpaceX was really close to achieving orbit, they got a few more customers, and specifically they got four. The first one being NASA. They would have two satellites, one being NanoSail D, which weighed around 4 kilograms and had an area of about 10 square meters when it would be fully extended in space. The other one being PreSat, being a small satellite that was trying to detect how yeast cells can grow within Earth's orbit. This was also really small, about the size of a loaf of bread. Now that's not the only customer. The Department of Defense also wanted to send up a Trailblazer satellite, which would be focusing on improving aspects of the Missile Defense Agency. We're not 100% sure what it was supposed to do, but it was supposed to take some measurements for the DoD. And the last customer was a company by the name of Celestis. 
and this company actually can send your ashes to space after you pass away. And on this mission, they were going to send up the ashes of Gordon Cooper, who was the youngest Gemini astronaut, as well as the Star Trek actor James Doohan, who played the chief engineer on the USS Enterprise, also known as Montgomery Scott or Scotty. Can't change the laws of physics. Now this was their biggest launch at the time, not only because it had four satellites on board, but also because they updated the Merlin engine from a Merlin A to a Merlin 1C. Now the reason for this was that they were also doing development on the Falcon 9 at the same time, and the Merlin A wasn't strong enough to get a launch vehicle of the size of a Falcon 9 up to space. Therefore they wanted to update it to a Falcon 1C. And since SpaceX and Elon were fairly confident in the first stage from the last launch, they thought that by replacing it, it wouldn't make that much of a difference in the overall mission. So on August 3rd of 2008, a little over two and a half years after their first launch, the Falcon 1 was again on the launch pad ready to go. Having an updated control system, new engines, and four satellites on board, SpaceX was really hoping for this to be their first successful mission. So again, let's watch and see what happened. So the first thing we can notice is the video quality has gotten a lot better. We also see, after a successful takeoff, very little movement during the ascent. The new Merlin C is showing great success and is actually doing better than expected. And as we forward to the separation stage, the engine cuts off, the separation occurs, but then the first stage has a second push. So let's watch this again, but much slower. When the first stage cuts off, there is a time delay due to residual thrust created by the engine. However, SpaceX underestimated the strength of the new engine, and thus it collided against the second stage. The collision isn't what caused the failure, but the second stage Kestrel engine actually ignited with the first stage right there, which led to the system going out of control, which we can see for a brief second before the video ends. Now this failure was a pretty big deal for SpaceX. Even though the engine worked perfectly, the four satellites on board were destroyed and they were running out of money pretty fast. But Elon Musk was still firmly passionate about what he believed in. Just a few days after the failure, he went out to the news and said, There should be absolutely zero question that SpaceX will prevail in reaching orbit and demonstrating reliable space transport. For my part, I will never give up, and I mean never. At the time, Elon Musk showed nothing but confidence. However, in recent years, he's actually said that was one of the hardest years of his life. Both SpaceX and Tesla were facing, and Musk personally took the blame for this third launch failure. And he also said that they would only have one more attempt, enough money to try it one more time, or else SpaceX would go bankrupt. Now to put this into perspective, the other company that got funding by NASA called Rocket Plane Chrysler, they actually went bankrupt a few months before this launch because of financial reasons. They didn't have enough money to make it happen. So almost everything was against SpaceX at this time. They really only had one more attempt at making it work. So you might think that the development of the Falcon 1, everything would be retested and try and figure out everything they can fix before this launch. But in reality, from the previous launch, they only had one thing that they needed to change, which was the time delay between the separation and when the second stage would ignite. Therefore, the next launch was only six weeks later, determining whether or not the company SpaceX would actually prevail or if they would fail. So let's go ahead and see what happened. Again, we see a smooth launch with stable control systems during the initial ascent. As we approach separation, the main engine cuts off, the new time delay waits, and separation is about to happen. Now this point is the defining moment for the entire company, so let's watch it in slow motion. Separation occurs, and the nozzle just barely makes it out without hitting the inner stage. Now the mission continued on to achieve orbit. Now as you can imagine, this was a pretty exciting moment for not just SpaceX, but the entire industry as a whole. SpaceX, this was their first time achieving orbit successfully, however it was also the first time a liquid powered rocket was successfully created to achieve orbit that was privately funded. Now after this mission was a success, the Falcon 1 would go on to fly one more mission before they put it to the side and focus directly on the development of the Falcon 9 and the Dragon capsule. 
whole. So in the next episode, we're going to step through the development of the Falcon 9, some of the first launches with the Dragon Capsule, and what their special Grasshopper rocket is. So thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the next one.